Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, April 20th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the governor signs a collection of bills he says will help mothers and children across the state. Then, the Director of Child Protection Services lays out changes to the agency under recently approved legislation. Plus, we check in on the state of health care access in tornado-damaged Rolling Fork. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Almost a year ago, Mississippi led the way to the greatest conservative win in my lifetime, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. When the Supreme Court issued the Dobbs decision last summer, a 2007 trigger law went into effect, essentially banning abortions in the state. In response, Governor Tate Reeves began rolling out what he's calling his new pro-life agenda. Following the decision, Reeves called on lawmakers to send him legislation that would better the lives of mothers and children in Mississippi. Yesterday, he signed a number of bills geared towards that. While I'm extremely proud of the role that Mississippi played in this monumental victory, winning a court case was never our true objective. Rather, the objective was to build a culture of life throughout our state and throughout our nation. Today, in Mississippi, we are leading the way in advancing support for moms and for babies. The legislation I am signing today is further proof that when it comes to protecting life, Mississippi isn't just talking the talk. We're actually walking the walk. The bills Reeves signed included a Foster Parents Bill of Rights. The legislation also increased the eligible tax credit for pregnancy resource centers from $3.5 million to $10 million. That tax credit was created last year for a select group of faith-based nonprofits linked with Pro-Life Mississippi. The centers do not provide medical care, but instead offer resources and supplies like diapers and formula. Efforts to expand qualified recipients during the session were unsuccessful. Reeves says the legislation is part of the next phase of his agenda. As I've said many times before, Mississippi has moved to the next phase in our pursuit to build a culture of life. That phase is the new pro-life agenda. I've also said this many times, this next phase will not be easy, and it will not be free. But it is the right thing to do. And Mississippi is committed to doing the right thing. I'm confident that all of us working together, we're going to continue to get the job done and deliver the support that Mississippi moms and Mississippi babies deserve. Now today, I'm signing a series of bills which lay the foundation for this agenda. They pave the way to our future, and they make our state even more supportive of mothers and children. Perhaps the most discussed piece of legislation this session geared toward mothers and babies was an extension of postpartum Medicaid coverage from eight weeks to 12 months. Reeves didn't include it yesterday in his planned remarks on his pro-life agenda, but did offer it when he was asked. I did not mention um, that um, because I signed it a month ago, I think, or maybe six weeks ago. Um, back, it passed during uh, the legislative session uh, once um, I came out and said that I would sign the, the legislation. It, it ultimately uh, got to my desk, and, and I did, and, and I'm hopeful that it will, uh, that it will help. Um, and I believe that, that there's a, a good chance that it, that it will. Um, you know, when we have these conversations, um, there's no doubt that, um, that, that sometimes some of these conversations are uncomfortable uh, for, for those of us in the, in the political sphere. And what I would tell you uh, about the, the postpartum care, and we tried very hard 
uh, to, to accumulate data. And one of the things that we have f figured out, and, and we, we certainly figured out during COVID, but it's been true since, and that is the, the State Department of Health um, and the state plan is really not set up in such a way where we have very good data at State Department of Health. When COVID hit, CMS said that every mother that uh, is on Medicaid was entitled to 12 months of postpartum care. And so what I was hoping as we moved into the 2023 legislative session is that we would have some data on and some statistics on has that fact that all of those Medicaid moms in 2020, 2021, 2022, um, and now the beginning of 2023, um, have we seen improved outcomes? And what we find is that we don't really have um, significant data. But it certainly stands to reason that if those moms in month three or month four or month five are going back to their physician and that the baby is going back to a physician and getting care, um, I certainly think that it stands to reason that, that we have hope and we have optimism that those outcomes will improve. Um, but, yeah, I did not mention the, that particular bill earlier today because I signed it, I think, six weeks or so ago. One of the bills signed by Reeves yesterday establishes the Mississippi Department of Child Protection Services as its own agency, now separate from the Department of Human Services. Coming up, the director of CPS lays out changes to the agency under recently approved legislation. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. If you aren't near a radio, you can still listen to MPB Think Radio and MPB Music Radio. You can download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone or listen online at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Governor Tate Reeves has signed several major bills that will reshape the state's adoption and foster care system. Following the Supreme Court's decision on Dobbs, the subsequent trigger ban on abortions, many lawmakers made it their priority to try and make life easier for children in state custody. One bill in particular will completely overhaul the Mississippi Department of Child Protection Services, making it an independent state agency. In the first of a two-part conversation, our Kobe Vance talks with Commissioner Andrea Sanders about the future of adoptions and foster care. It was a really busy year for families and children, and in general, that's a really positive thing. Uh, it tells me that, that our leadership and our decision makers are focusing on children and families. Of course, everyone comes at the problem from a different perspective. So it was an interesting and, and uh, fast-paced session for our agency and, and really for you know, a lot of services that are designed to help families and children. I think it was positive. We, as an agency, walked away with some critical things that we needed to move forward and to, to function more efficiently. Going down some of the major legislation, we saw eight major bills that were specifically focused on um, foster care systems and uh, things of that nature. One of the major ones was House Bill 1149. That did three major things. Child Protective Services will become its own independent state agency. Uh, it involved a pathway to permanency section for trying to streamline the court system and the adoption process. Can you tell us a little bit about those? How are those going to be changing the future of foster care and adoptions in Mississippi? First part of that bill, the separation from DHS is really more finalizing something that was started in 2016, part of the Olivia Y lawsuit strongly recommended that Division of Family and Children Services be separated from the broader human services agency as a standalone agency. And that really had to do with bringing focus to the work, recognizing that the work 
done in CPS or what was then Division of Family and Children's Services is really unique. We are first responders. We work 24-7 and investigate whether or not a child is, is being abused or neglected. And then we take custody of those children. So that work got stalled uh, legislatively through the course of the last six years, and it left both agencies connected in an odd way, and, and it left us sharing some services that really created more inefficiencies than efficiencies. So we're just finalizing something that someone started you know, six years ago, and we do think it will make us more efficient at strategically drawing down federal funds that are designed for child welfare. So we've got a lot of work to do to, to finalize that separation and get set up so that we can draw down that funding, but we think that it will mean additional funding coming into the state from, from the federal level to help support our work. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. The other two parts of that bill, the pathway to permanency, that's really a sort of a collection of le legislation that the agency put forward. And the intent is to start looking at how we address children who are vulnerable, who are in families who are vulnerable, who either are have a potential of being abused or neglected or are being abused or neglected. Start looking at them from basically the child's perspective. What, is, what does the system look like when a child tries to walk through it? I call it from front door to back door. Starting to look at our system that way instead of a functionality standpoint. So what we did originally was we created a process map that shows what it's like for a child to get first into custody. So in what I call the front door of the agency and then to move efficiently back out of custody to some form of permanency. First, it, it makes it clear that the agency is a party in all legal matters that the child has to go through to get to permanency in some way. In Mississippi, a child has to go through three separate legal causes of action before they can get to permanency. Those are separate cases. They're filed in separate types of courts in many jurisdictions. There are different parties who are prosecuting the case or pushing the case, even when everybody is doing their very best work, it creates places where the child can get hung up. Our goal is to get them, we want them in custody when it's necessary for their safety and not a day longer. The state is always going to be a poor substitute for family. Children don't need to come in and, and just live in foster care or in custody. They either need to go back to their biological family if that can be done so safely or they need to move with some efficiency to a more permanent setting. And our goal, kind of a national goal, is that that should take about 15 to 18 months. Every case is different. We're dealing with human beings and families, and our goal is not to disrupt families if it's not necessary. So that legislation was probably some first steps in trying to streamline that legal path to get from the front door of the agency to the back door. And I think we really accomplished raising awareness of what that looks like for kids and families and also acknowledging that CPS doesn't, we can't take kids into custody. That's a legal matter. Uh, it requires the authority of the court as it should. I often say it should be harder to take someone's child than their land. So the court has to make certain findings and the agency has to make sure that we present the court with enough evidence do what it needs to do. We see this legislation as, as a first step towards trying to streamline the entire legal process. But that's where that third part of the, the bill comes in, the Commission on the Uniform Youth Court. Um, I think that it was clear this session that most people agree that a uniform system for hearing these cases that is specialized and has some predictability to it would create better outcomes for children. What that court looks like, you know, we, we have a lot of varying opinions, and that's a good thing. It means that we've got a lot of sharp minds thinking about the problem. So this commission really is in recognition that the state wants to move towards a system that is more uniform for kids and families to travel through 
get from that front door to the back door of state custody. So I'm pleased to get that legislation enacted, and we are, we are eager to get that work started. Commissioner Andrea Sanders of Mississippi Department of Child Protection Services with our Kobe Vance. Coming up, we check in on the state of health care access in Tornado Damage Rolling Fork. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. Hi, Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. Please join me and my colleagues for the Mississippi Arts Hour, where we have in-depth conversations with different creative Mississippians. That's the Mississippi Arts Hour, Sundays at 5 on Think Radio, or download it as a podcast. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The March 24th tornado that hit Rolling Fork left the Sharkey Issaquina Hospital with extensive roof and water damage. Since then, they've been operating out of an old armory in town with the help of the University of Mississippi Medical Center. MPB's Lacey Alexander went back to Rolling Fork to see how access to health care has changed since the storm. She met with CEO Jerry Kiever. Our staff is... Uh working just like they would in our hospital, but we do are supported by the University Medical Center. They helped us get that set up. I'm very grateful for them that they did that. Our health clinics are certainly back open in the same location they were in. We have actually three health clinics on the campus of the hospital, the original hospital, and those clinics were back open the next week. With the temporary hospital, what would you say the biggest difference is between today and the day y'all had to set up in that space? Um, well, we've got so many displaced work. Um, we had some displaced workers. Unfortunately, we did have one worker that was killed during the storm who was off duty. Um, the biggest thing for us is our nursing home. We have 44 residents that were in that facility the night of the tornado. And we had to relocate all of those um, patients the next day uh, to other facilities, uh, Greenville, Yazoo City, Vicksburg, just wherever we could find a vacant bed. And so our primary goal at this point is get the nursing home back up and running because we want those people back home because uh, they look at the nursing home as their home and they look at our staff as their family because they spend most of uh, their time around our people. Um, So we're we're, we're concerned about them getting back home, and also we're concerned to some of the... There's a mental aspect that goes to any tragedy, but especially for an elderly person um, when they're displaced. And we certainly don't want to exacerbate any um, mental anguish they already have, so our goal is to get them back as soon as possible. Um, And... That's that's our primary focus at this point is dealing with the nursing home. They got this set up pretty nice. It's it really is. They they did a good job on it. Okay. That's Kenneth Norris. The Mayorsville resident was getting treatment for cancer at the main center and has been coming to the temporary location for a couple of weeks. And how is care here different than it was back at the old place? I think it's a little better because you don't have as many people and they get to you real quick and I was here for a couple of days and I was the only patient so I I just got all kind of, they were bringing food to me all the time, something to drink, they didn't have nothing to do so they were studying on me. In your community, what are some of the biggest differences since the storm came through? Well, no businesses. They all pretty much messed up. They're trying to get them started, and uh, nowhere to go to eat really, because that's all gone. And everybody's off staying in motels and stuff. I guess they're send got them sent away. And uh, like the store down here, uh, Stop and Shop, it's in 
at probably having some difficulty because there's nobody shopping there. Everybody's displaced, you know, somewhere else. So I imagine all the businesses are hurting that's trying to get started again. Uh, service numbers probably the only one really <laughs> doing good right here because we have to go to Greenville or Vicksburg to uh, go to a place to get wood yeah, or lumber five, stuff five, to build and work on stuff. So when you come in here for these services and you're in this mobile space, this new space, what can you tell about the community here? How have they bounced back since the storm? Well, they're really still cleaning up, and I believe we're going. To, a lot of people will leave. You know, they're getting. They've got grandkids uh, that are that are somewhere else, and their children and stuff. And they probably thinking about would like to go there anyway and then now the house is destroyed so they'll probably just go to where the kids are and that way they'll be close to their kids and grandkids because there's a lot of grand people around here that the kids aren't even living here anymore. I hope not because it's a lot of clean. It's still a long time cleaning this place up. You can drive through it and it's just destroyed. I don't, I don't know what people are going to do because it's, it's just slab after slab when you look. And uh, it's enough trees. It's going to take a long time to move them. So I hope they keep <laughs> keep us in mind because uh, it's still a lot of trees down and houses all just piled up. Yeah. How many times do you think you visited this mobile hospital? Uh, it's been uh, four times. And... Uh, it's it's nice. It sure is. They got it got it fixed up good. So you don't feel like the treatment has been compromised at all? No, yep. It probably better. Yeah. It's it's really is. It's a good place. It worked out good. Everything's closer. And when you get like I am, I can't hardly walk anyway. It makes it a whole lot easier just to walk ten feet to the lab or radio. You know, get an X ray and. Everything's just right here instead of walking way down the hall to something, yeah. you know. So it's working nice. They're going to be here, they said, maybe a year or two. So I don't know. It looks like the hospital we got tore up more than I thought. Yeah. So in your opinion, when all of this rubble is here, why is it important for this health care center and the people that have been working in health care here to still be here in the midst of all this chaos? Oh, it's people, you know, sick here that need the care. If I don't know if they wasn't here, you'd have to go to Jackson or something like that. I'd, I'd Baptist or Methodist Hospital, someone or something over there. So uh, it sure saves some time. So you would say it improves your life to oh, have something this Oh, close? yeah. I, I couldn't make it to Jackson and back hardly. I tried that uh, couple of weeks ago and I was give out so I'm glad it's right here. Yeah. The temporary hospital is also filling prescriptions for residents. This has been